joining us for our Healthier Black Elders Lunch and Learn today. We are going to give folks a few minutes to join before we get started. And if we could have all the attendees remain muted, it'll just help us hear our speakers clearly. Thank you. research and the amount of minority scientists conducting research on minority populations. This created various centers across the country that focuses on a particular population. Here in Michigan, it created the Michigan Center for Urban African American Aging Research, or what we call MUCWAR. MUCWAR is jointly run by Wayne State University, Michigan State University, and the University of Michigan. The Healthier Black Elder Center is the community core of MUCWAR. HBC is a wonderful program that aims to address and reduce health disparities through research and education. We host various events that provide health-related education to the community with a focus on aging. We provide education on topics that range from diabetes and heart health to food safety, nutrition, creating healthy habits, brain health, and more. I'm very sorry we can't be holding this event in person together, but I am happy that we can still connect this way to keep providing education in the meantime. To learn more about our program, please visit our website at www.m as in Mary, C as in cat, uaaar.org. Or you can call our office at 313-664-2616. And I'll say that website and phone number again. The website is www.m as in Mary, C as in cat, uaaar.org. And our phone number is 313-664-2616. One six. I would like to make just a couple of housekeeping announcements. Um, please remain muted during the event so we can hear the speakers as best as possible. This webinar is being recorded and it will be available to watch at a later time on our website. For those that are joining us by computer, if you have a question for any of the speakers, please submit your questions in the Zoom chat or in the Q&A box at any time. The Q&A button can be found at the bottom of your Zoom window. For those that are joining by telephone, if you have a question that does not get answered by the end of our program, please call our HBEC office and leave a message with your question and one of our staff will follow up with you. To start today's program, we will have a short presentation from a researcher that used the HBEC program to recruit for her study, Dr. Robin Brewer. Dr. Brewer is an assistant professor of information at the School of Information and an assistant professor of electrical engineering and computer science at the College of Engineering at the University of Michigan. She will be sharing her results from her study titled Seniors and Technology Use During COVID-19. Hello and, Dr. and welcome Dr. Robin Brewer. Great, thank you so much. I am very excited to be here virtually with you all today. Again, my name is Robin Brewer. I am a professor at the University of Michigan in the School of Information. And today I'm going to be talking about findings from surveys and interviews that I did um, with students over this past summer on how seniors use technology during the COVID-19 pandemic. So next slide, thank you. As you all are well aware, COVID-19 affected how everyone engages with friends, family, um, and others like doctors or dentists. Often, and especially for people over the age of 60, loneliness dominates much of the media and the research literature. It's one that seems depressing or negative. 
Um, although that may be the case for some, we also saw how COVID narratives can communicate strength and resilience, especially related to technology use. So while technology can sometimes feel like it isolates people, we also know that it can be used as a tool to connect people over a distance. So the double-edged sword of technology use helps to motivate two main research questions. One, how has technology use changed for people over the age of 60 due to COVID-19? Are people using technology more or less or in different ways? And then two, how do people want technology to support them when they are isolated from other people? So what can technology designers do better. Next slide, thank you. We surveyed people over the age of 60. Um, the surveys were done on the computer or by phone. We then interviewed a subset of these people who completed the survey about how they connected with other people during COVID. Um, so many of the survey and the interview participants were from um, HBEC, so thank you to anyone on the call who may have participated. Um, and so next I'm going to present four of the main findings. First, the survey data showed that everyone's technology use increased. You, you may have guessed this. If we're not in person, we're turning to technology. Um, but what type of technology? It was mostly using video chat technologies like Zoom, which we're on today, uh, FaceTime and Duo. So 59% of the people who took the survey said they increased their use of video technologies. In the interviews, one person described how there was more email and Zoom and that FaceTime stuff that they would have never used before because their family lived nearby. Um, but now there's more of a necessity to use technology, even for people who are a five minute drive down the street because we're not supposed to be engaging as much in person with other people. Um, and this participant is describing this increase in technology use as a good thing. From this example and others, we saw how many seniors were driven to try new technologies to access church services or communicate with family members. So another person described how with immediate family, instead of going over and having dinner together on Friday nights, that they now have a FaceTime meeting. So many of the people on the call may, um, may have adjusted how they use technology, how they use technology with other family members, with friends. You may be doing more things in groups uh, like today's call, which is usually in person and now transitioning uh, to online. But a lot of people were motivated by religious services or motivated by family members who encouraged them to try new things. Yet while you can see someone's facial expressions on a video call, uh, you can hear the emotion in their voice, Many people described video technologies as feeling inauthentic and not working well for large group interactions. Uh, one person admitted that church services have been a real downer online, right? Saying it's no one's fault, but that it's such a hard thing to reproduce online. Being in the same room with other people makes all the difference. People also missed hugs, right? So part of church services as well as being able to hug and engage with other people. One person said after 60 plus years of being able to hug, now it's dangerous to do so. Um, so we can all relate to this, this quote and the one about church being a, a downer in the previous example shows how technology does not always do well with intimate interactions. Some people in the study described creating their own safe in-person experiences in lieu of technology's faults. For example, small groups of friends in someone's backyard or in a barn where everyone would wear a mask. 
Others created their own communities, their own smaller communities online. For example, one person started a book club with a few friends on Zoom. Um, and this shows that where technology in these large group spaces failed to meet their needs, people would create their own workarounds, whether that's with smaller groups online or smaller groups in person. So while there are, uh, next slide please. While there are uh, many other findings, we can start to take away that people of all ages, including over the age of 60, are using technology in new ways due to COVID to build community with others. However, technology needs to do a better job at making large group interactions feel more personal. And this is my final slide. I'm not sure if we have time, but I'm happy to hear ideas that people have about how technology can feel more personal or answer questions. If there is no time, you can also email me at r, n as in Nancy, b as in boy, r e w, at u, m as in Mary, i c h dot edu. So r n brew at umich dot edu. Um, and then I think on the, the first slide um, that was presented, it had my phone number as well, my office number. So you can feel free to reach me by phone at 734-615-1299 or the email address. So thank you everyone. All right, thank you very much for uh, sharing this, these Wonderful results there, Dr. Brewer. Uh, we appreciate that greatly. Um, my name is Sean Nurick. Um, I am Vanessa's counterpart for the, uh, the Flint Healthier Black Elder Center. Uh, I would again like to take this time to encourage you to ask any questions uh, for the presenters uh, in the Q&A box located on your device. Uh, we will attempt to have our panelists answer as many questions as possible at the conclusion of the presentations, time permitting. Uh, there were comments that some of the sound may be a little choppy on your end. Um, we're not having any problems over here. I may suggest logging out of the webinar, um, closing down Zoom and then reopening it and log back in. That may help you out. Um, so we will move on to um, our main presentations here. Our first speaker is Dr. Peter Lichtenberg who will present on grief and healing. Dr. Lichtenberg is a director of the Institute of Gerontology at Wayne State University, and he's the co-leader of MICWAR. Although his more recent work has focused on financial decision-making, financial exploitation, and financial capacity in older adults, uh, he has personal experiences of grief and loss uh, that have defined his character and contributed to his extensive work in neurocognitive impairment, late life depression, and impacts on the quality of life and longevity. Our second speaker uh, will be Dr. Jennifer Johnson, uh, who is the C.S. Mott Endowed Professor of Public Health, uh, a professor of OBGYN and psychiatry and behavioral medicine at Michigan State University in the College of Human Medicine. Dr. Johnson is a licensed clinical psychologist who conducts research on implement implementation of mental health and substance use uh, interventions for vulnerable populations. She will be speaking today on recognizing the signs of depression and how to cope. Our third speaker uh, is Dr. Kent Key, uh, who is a health disparities researcher specializing in community-engaged research appro uh, approaches in the Division of Public Health um, in the College of Human Medicine at Michigan State University. He's also one of the co-faculty leaders of the HBEC. Dr. Key will give a presentation on ways to engage your community and how to deal with these issues in the midst of COVID-19. He will end our uh, event by facilitating uh, question and answer time with the speakers. Thank you very much. Um, and Dr. Lichtenberg, uh, Peter, uh, it, it's my honor to, uh, to hand it over to you. So let's, thank you, let's, Sean. Let's... If you go ahead to the next slide, I really appreciate the invitation to, to be here. And for those on the phone, the title of my talk is Twice in a Lifetime. Grief and Healing, Perspectives from a Gerontologist Widowed at Ages 25 and 54 Years. In my research, I've also uh, done quite a bit in terms of 
loss and grief and how it relates to a late life depression. So I'm gonna to try to weave in some of the personal and some of uh, the research that we know from the field. And if you go to the next slide, Sean, uh, we'll get going here. So I was invited by the editor of the gerontologist when they had a special issue on aging, it's personal to write this article, Grief and Healing in Young and Middle Age, A Widower's Journey be happy to share it with anybody that wants that article. Next slide, please. Well, let me introduce Rebecca Clausen Lichtenberg. She was born in 1959, two days after me. So she was the younger set and she married me and I married her in 1981. Becky died November 14th. 1984. Next slide, please. So she was my college sweetheart. And in the background, for those on the phone who can't see, is a very proud woman. It's one of my all time favorite pictures. That's my grandmother on my mother's side, who, unbeknownst to us, was really laboring with some heart condition and uh, died a mere four months after this picture was taken. And it's quite a treasured picture of my grandmother looking on, Becky and I in our graduation gowns. Next slide. Go ahead and pass that one, Sean. So let me tell you about November, 1984, as we go to the next slide. Go ahead, Sean, to the next one. This is a picture of Becky lying on the beach. And uh, this picture actually was taken at PJ Hoffmaster State Park and a year before she died. But for those on the phone, let me just say she's lying down, joking around, holding a Frisbee in her hand. Now, this is often the picture I have of, of how Becky uh, probably looked when she died. I woke up on November 14th at 6.47 a.m. And in my heart and head, I knew that Becky was dead immediately. And then I heard the ambulance. Becky died while jogging. She had a sudden cardiac arrhythmia and she was gone all too soon. Next slide, please. So Eric Lindemann, in 1944, did some of the first research surveys on early grief, especially for unexpected loss. And this was uh, the Coconut Grove fire in uh, outside of Boston, Massachusetts. And some of the things that he described, some of the things that I could totally relate to, some of the physical symptoms, just simply a tightness in my chest and the throat, lack of sleep, tearfulness, some of the psychological symptoms, an obsession with the deceased and, and how the death occurred, feelings of guilt, and some of the kind of phases of grief that he termed shock, searching, suffering. And when we think about grief and loss during the time of COVID, we really think about a lot of sudden losses that also are traumatic. And so that increases these physical and psychological symptoms during shock. And also this very strange phenomenon that happens so often uh, called searching. And the best way I can describe it is my aunt who lost her husband, my uncle Alan, who was a TWA pilot. He died of pancreatic cancer when he was still a pilot. And she was used to him being gone. So during her, these first few months of grief, about every four or five days, she'd almost find herself driving out. And on occasion she did to the airport to pick him up. And that's sort of the searching phenomena, returning time and time again to places where you might find 
your lost loved one. This is interesting to note that John Bowlby has found this in all kinds of animals too, when they lose a young one, that searching is almost universal. And then suffering, what Lindemann describes when the head and heart come together and you know that the reality of the loss becomes deeper. Next slide, please. Well, how about the stress and coping research? You know, there are more problems with coping when the event is what we call off time. So nobody's supposed to bury a 25 year old. That's a very off time event. And some of the coping is poorer when the person is younger, the death is unexpected and viewed as preventable. And what these researchers did was they had uh, people who were grieving uh, keep journals and write some narratives. And those narratives were more pessimistic, uh, self-deprecating and less filled with gratitude. So we can see that um, the trauma of a loss like this really can impact um, widowhood in some very particular ways that make it more difficult to heal from. Next slide, please. William Worden, four tasks of grief, I think are really very useful. He uh, is, was out of Harvard University. The four tasks that everybody who is grieving has to do, accept the reality of the loss, work through the pain of grief, adjust to the environment in which the deceased is missing and emotionally relocate the deceased and move on with life. Next slide, please. So what's special about Worden's model, it shows that grief and healing are active. They require some choice, not just the passage of time. Everybody who is grieving has to decide that they are going to adjust to the environment in which the deceased is missing and work towards healing. But healing takes time and healing always takes longer than we expect as the person is grieving and also others expect as a person that's not grieving in the same way because the environment is totally changed. So I like to think about when I was 25, I lost my whole life and had to recreate a new one. I didn't lose myself, but I did lose the life I was leading. Now, Worden's model also incorporates the fact that the relationship with the deceased never ends, but it must change if healing is to occur. Next slide, please. There's something called complicated grief. And in complicated grief, we see that well past the period where we would expect to see some healthy healing, we see a lot of separation, distress, a lot of yearning, continued searching, continued preoccupation with our loved one and severe loneliness and traumatic distress ways in which individuals are traumatized by sudden death, often a lot of numbness, avoidance, or anger. So a lot of strange kinds of intense experiences. Next slide. And one loss always calls up other losses. So it's interesting to note that researchers have found that those who had had an early death or desertion by age 16, when they had a widowhood experience, they had more depression, less family satisfaction, and less resources. So one death calls up the past losses as well. Next slide, please. I was very fortunate in my career five years later, actually it was a mere two years later, 
but right around age 30. I found a mentor uh, in Virginia, Jeff Barth, who continues to be my mentor and really family to this day, 34 years later. And Jeff, next slide please, really helped as I began to heal in beautiful Shenandoah Valley of Virginia. For those of you on the phone, I just have some nice pictures of the mountains with the valley next to it, and also the streets of a little town called Stanton, Virginia, which is a beautiful little town in uh, the Shenandoah Valley. Next slide, please. I came to Michigan in 1991 for a job. Everybody asked me, how could you leave the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia? It's so beautiful. And my standard answer was, listen, I'm from Philadelphia. Not everybody was meant to live in the Garden of Eden. And I feel right at home with Detroit because it's a lot like Philadelphia. It's a big sports town, a blue collar town, and I love it. I've been here 30 years now and it fits beautifully. And here I met Susan, Susan McNeil Lichtenberg, my colleague first and my wife. She was born four years after I was. We were married in 1999 and Susan died of metastatic breast cancer in February of 2014. Next slide, please. I'm sorry for those of you on the phone, I put in a slide that captures Susan's spirit. Here she is at Lake Huron, one of our early trips, uh, kind of fooling around, a beautiful standing on a rock with her arms out, showing me her wonderful balance. But that smile is exactly what uh, permeates my soul till through today. Next slide, please. So this was really something, Susan was my colleague. We published over 30 papers together, but we also loved to jog together, go to the movies, play tennis, just have a lot of fun. Next slide, please. And we had a family together. And so here we see me and Susan with Emily, Thomas, and Sophie. Next slide, please. Susan was a cancer survivor, next slide. She was diagnosed with metastatic cancer and uh, bravely went through a number of treatments and was really never down for the count uh, for 44 months, but the treatments ended up damaging her heart and she also died suddenly. Showing two pictures here, one of, this is after we knew about the diagnosis, a trip that we, we kept because we, we, we had it on the books and we're so glad we did it. Ended up being a celebration of our old life as we transitioned to the new life with cancer. And in the picture of Susan alone, you can sort of see some of the fear in her eyes. In the picture of us together, you could just see the joy that we had together and the support that we gave each other. Next slide, please. Susan uh, was featured in a Detroit Free Press article about how she handled breast cancer's toll. You know, Susan was inspiring. She inspired so many people. I know she inspired me by how she was so physically strong. She went through six different chemos, uh, some immune treatments, radiation, surgery, and uh, she was as, as strong as ever. Next slide, please. Go ahead to the next one after that. Well, what happened after Susan's death? Well, there are a couple of things that we need to think about. One is what Ruben calls two-track theory. All of a sudden, we, we sort of have uh, two paths. They're somewhat parallel. Sometimes they intersect. Time on our own, biopsychosocial needs, healing, but also we mold the ongoing relationship with the deceased. You know, it's interesting because I always felt like Becky handed me to Susan. And Susan and I talked about Becky quite a bit. And Susan used to say to me, well, I talked to Becky all the time trying to figure out what to do with you. So I knew that she had captured Becky's spirit 
And now I have the relationship of, with Susan as well. Strobe and Shutt talk about dual process theory, activities that are loss oriented and those that are restoration oriented. Next slide, please. So one way that I have found meaning, and there are a lot of ways, and there's a lot of healing. You know, Susan's death was very hard, but not traumatic. It was expected at some point. And I didn't have those same physical or psychological symptoms of in the same types of struggle. It was more the emptiness and sadness. But one way I decided to honor them was it was always bothered me that I had no living a legacy for Becky. And so I created a legacy for both of them. It's the Lichtenberg Scholarship in Geropsychology at Washington University in St. Louis, Becky and my alma mater, and Susan's field, since she was a geropsychologist too. And each person, I now have had four scholarship recipients, some get it for a couple years in a row. Each person that gets it gets a little write up about Susan and Becky and who they were and why they're being honored. And that means a lot to me, that at least somewhere, somebody is learning about two women that died well before their time, one at 25, one just shy of her 51st birthday, but who were two of the most precious people the world would ever know. Next slide, please. So with the help of some colleagues, I also wrote a short personal story Grief and Healing Against the Odds, and that's available, and as well as uh, every now and then I get on and write a blog. Thank you very much, Sean, for handling the slides and for giving me the opportunity to share today. Thank you, Peter, for uh, for sharing such a such a touching personal story. Uh, we, we appreciate your your candor and your, your vulnerability. Uh, right. Uh, we're going to move on to our second presenter, uh, Dr. Jennifer Johnson. And Jennifer, uh, you want to take it away? Sure. Um, thanks. Yeah, you know, I'm a, a, like I said, a licensed clinical psychologist. I'm a practicing therapist and a therapy researcher, and I deal a lot with both depression and grief, which are different. I mean, they can happen at the same time, but they're different. And I, um, I guess I, I'm a little bit floored by how beautiful that explanation of grief was, both in terms of being personal and just being like such um, a good, those are like exactly the steps, right? That we try to help people walk through is like first the sort of blinding pain and people just can't do it. And then, you know, how do you figure out to, how to stay connected to the person, but, but keep living because ultimately that's what you have to do. So I, I guess I just wanted to reiterate everything the first speaker said, and, and it's probably the best explanation of grief and recovery I've ever heard. So thank you for that. Um, so, you know, depression, a little bit different. Um, technically, it, it's defined by having at least five of the following things during the same two week period. Um, so depressed mood, most of the day, nearly every day, feeling sad, empty, or hopeless, a loss of interest in things you usually enjoy. Um, that's a pretty good indicator if you have that, um, you just none of the things that you like are interesting to you. Um, significant weight loss or weight gain or change in appetite, um, trouble sleeping or sleeping too much. Um, talking or moving so slowly that other people notice it or being so fidgety or restless, you can't sit still. So I know some of these are opposites, but there are some people that when they get depressed, they feel this lack of interest and depressed mood and they either get really fidgety and can't sleep and can't eat or they eat too much. They're tired all the time. They sleep too much, right? But it's sort of this idea that it's a change from how you normally are. Um, uh, feeling worthless or overly guilty nearly every day, trouble thinking or concentrating more than normal, 
and thoughts about death or that you would be better off dead. So, you know, it's, um, it can look a little bit different in different people, but these, this core sort of sense of depressed mood or loss of interest in things you usually enjoy are really central. Um, next slide, please. Oh. So, you know, what causes depression? Um, like most health and mental health things, it's some combination of your genes, the world around you, um, and, you know, and what's going on around you. Um, if you could go to the next slide. Um, if you have, if, if there are other people in your family who've been depressed before, um, you're more likely to be depressed. Um, relative to some other mental health conditions, um, depression is less genetic than many. They say it's maybe 30, 35%. Um, a lot of it has to do with life circumstances. Um, but there is this sort of vulnerability um, that is biological and that, you know, is inherited through your family. If you had a parent who got depressed or siblings or grandparents, you're more likely to get depressed. And if you've been, had depression in the past, you're at in, increased risk of having it again. Um, though I think the good thing is that people get better at coping with it and understanding what it is and how to deal with it over time. If you could go to the next slide. So one of the big contributors to depression though, I would say maybe 60, 70% of it is stressful life circumstances. So um, any change in your life, um, especially if it sort of changes your role in the world, um, can potentially trigger depression. When I, you know, as a therapist, when I'm talking to people and listening to what was going on in their lives when their mood changed, I'm listening for one of these four things. So, you know, um, if you have a heart attack, if you're ill, um, if you, you know, have some change in your ability to um, work or get around, you know, that is a potentially a trigger for depression, retirement, um, moving, you know, and uh, younger people having a baby, even things you would think are good things, but if they are different and potentially stressful, like having a baby, um, they can, you know, trigger depression, um, bereavement. Obviously, like I said, it was so eloquently described, um, can be a trigger for depression. Um, there's a lot of, for, for a while, you couldn't diagnose depression if it happened after bereavement because people didn't want to say that normal grieving was like a disorder, which makes sense to me. But the argument, it was recently changed because the argument is that you would diagnose depression after any other stressful life event, whether it was like a heart attack or a move or a retirement or a divorce. So why would we leave this out? So not all grieving um, is depression, but depression does sometimes follow bereavement. Um, conflicts with people who matter to you. So, you know, a, a partner, a child, a, a colleague, people who are important to you if those relationships are conflictual. Um, that can trigger depression. And then isolation, just feeling alone. One of the best predictors of recovery from depression or not being depressed is the amount of social support people feel like they have. Um, when they feel connected to happy relationships around them, they're less likely to be depressed, but people who feel isolated um, are more likely to get depressed. So, you know, you, you are going along in life um, if there's a big bump in the road, um, almost anyone can get depressed. Um, and if you have a little bit of genetic vulnerability, you're just a little bit more likely. Um, if you could go to the next slide. So, you know, what can you do? So there's a variety of things you can do. And this slide are things that I would call, um, I, I don't know, like the, the low level things, they won't necessarily change a really severe bout of depression, but they will help you feel a little bit better and they may help stave off mild depression, right? So exercising any way you can helps um, reach out to loved ones, um, you know, tell them you love them, give them a call, 
um, keep a schedule. It's really hard when, when you feel depressed because you feel like doing nothing and nothing seems interesting. But the more you do nothing, the worse you feel. So there is this piece in depression where at first you're forcing yourself to do things that you used to enjoy um, or just forcing yourself to do things and then you start to feel better. Um, but it's a little bit of a fake it till you make it um, with that. So, you know, keep a schedule, get up, go for a walk, call somebody, you know, just, just try to make yourself keep a schedule. Um, take care of yourself and practice self-forgiveness. Um, when people are depressed, they tend to have this um, overly sense of worthlessness or guilty about things that aren't really their fault or they don't have a lot of control over. Um, and so something that's important when you're feeling depressed is just to practice self-acceptance. Um, and if other people around you are telling you that they see you better than you see yourself, um, you know, try to believe them because it's probably true. Um, take care of your body, you know, try to get good sleep, fruits and vegetables, minimize substances, focus on things you can control. If you're someone who gets sucked into the news about bad events, limit the time you spend doing that. Uh, if you could go to the next slide. So I would say that one of the main things I wanted to say is, you know, depression is really treatable. We know so much about it. Um, it absolutely can be treated. Um, you know, both counseling and medications help. Some people do better with one or the other. Some people need both. Um, but a lot of people go untreated. <laughs> they never reach out for help. And um, I guess this is my slide about saying no to stigma. You know, more than 20% of people have had major depressive disorder in their lifetimes. Um, and this was all ages of people, so probably more will, you know, over the course of their lives. We're human, you know, if, if we get hit with something out of the blue, if our life changes, if we're not sleeping well, if we're under a lot of stress, sometimes we get depressed. That, that's, you know, part of being human. It's part of being a person. It's not a big deal. It's just a thing that happened that there are treatments for. So please don't um, like feel like it's your fault or feel like, uh, you know, you can't reach out because it's, it's very treatable. And as a therapist, honestly, I wish sometimes people think they can gut it through. And then by the time they come, it's really, really bad. And I often just wish people would come early because there's no need to suffer like that for that long. Uh, if you could go on to the next slide. Um, it's okay and important to ask for help. You know, especially, you know, one of the things I do is we know you're going to go through a stressful time, like I said, a new baby or an illness or, or something, you don't have to try to be a hero. You know, ask, there are times that we all need more help from people. And so think about what help you need and ask for it. I put this slide up with the quote from the Beatles, we get by with a little help from our friends. And that's completely true. Um, social support, uh, the extent to which you feel like there are people in your life you can talk to or people you can ask for favors um, has strong effects on depression. So, you know, tell someone how you're feeling. Another one of the tricky things with depression is not only do people sometimes not feel like doing anything, they don't feel like talking to anyone. Um, and so you've got to kind of push yourself out of what's comfortable to tell someone how you're feeling, ask them for help, um, even if it's a little bit uncomfortable. If you go to the next slide. So where can you find help? Um, there are a lot of places, you know, a good place is talk to your doctor if you have one. Um, you know, doctors tend to prescribe more than offer counseling, but they can help you find somebody who can offer counseling if that's what you want. Um, if you have insurance, you can call your insurance people and, and ask for somebody near you. Um, there are also directories online. So for example, I have some, um, some listed here, this um, www.mhanational.org um, has a, a list of counselors. Um, there's one called www.goodtherapy.org where you can find folks in Detroit. 
Um, if you Google psychology today, there are you counselors in Michigan and there's a Detroit Wayne Integrated Mental Health Network that has a 24 hour helpline that you can call for yourself or, or someone you're concerned about. And that's 1-800-241-4949. Four, nine, four, nine. And if people want those, we can probably put them in the chat at the end. Um, so suicide prevention. Uh, I wanted to talk about this because it's, it's a thing that comes up um, both in depression, especially, but sometimes in complicated grief, you'll have somebody that says, I just wanna die to be with the person I lost. Um, and in this case, you know, what I would say here is if you think someone around you might be thinking about suicide, assume you're the only one who will reach out. So just ask them and ask them point, you know, pretty much straightforwardly. Um, research shows you're not going to put the idea in someone's head. So, so just ask. Um, and so there's some tips on how to talk with someone who may be struggling with their mental health, you know, have an honest conversation talk to them in private, listen to their story, tell them that you care about them, ask them directly if they're thinking about suicide. So after you know, you've heard them and what's going on and say, you know, have you had any thoughts about suicide? Um, encourage them to seek treatment or contact their doctor or therapist and don't debate the value of life or minimize their problems or give advice, any of that. You don't have to fix it. Just say, I care about you. I'm concerned, are you thinking about suicide? Can I help you contact your doctor? Um, if the person says they're considering suicide, take it seriously. Um, you know, there's this sort of thing I hear sometimes is um, they're just doing it for attention. And I can say the last time I heard that come from somebody, the person they were talking about died by suicide. It's not, that's not really a thing. So, you know, I would say if they say they are, um, take it seriously, stay with them. If they have things in the house that are lethal, try to move them somewhere else for a while. So, you know, firearms, pills, th things, you know, that they might use to hurt themselves. And there's a national suicide prevention lifeline that I have on here, 1-800-273. 8255. And that's 1-800-273-8255. And, you know, if in doubt, just ask, you know, go with them to the emergency room or to mental health services, but don't leave them alone. Um, if you could go to the next slide. Mostly I put this on here because I didn't want to end with suicide, but, um, you know, I would say, like I said, we're, we're people, things happen. We're going to we're not always in the best physical health. So it doesn't make any sense to think that, you know, you're, we're always gonna be in the best mental health. We, it needs maintenance too. Depression is super treatable. It's just a thing that happens sometimes. So take care of yourself and those around you and, and you know, go ask for help. So that's the end of my slide. All right, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, now uh, we'll pass the baton to Dr. Kent Key. Um, we've already introduced. Uh, Kent, take it away. So hello everyone. And I would like to first just thank our previous speakers for giving us such a in-depth understanding and really knowledge um, around grief, loss and depression, which we know many of us deal with um, throughout various phases of our life. And sometime when we have intersecting issues in our life, that happens. And so I just kind of want to, you can go to the next slide, um, Sean, just want to kind of talk about some ways to engage and use your social networks when you're dealing with this. Um, I too have a short little um, experience. Um, so since COVID has happened, I have had over eight loved ones to pass away. And I kind of want to talk about grief, loss, and depression in, relative to COVID. And one particular situation or scenario, I had a cousin in Atlanta who was called in to do jury duty a week.
All right, everybody, please hold on for one second. We're having it's minor technical juror difficulties. In juror pool. I'm sorry. Sorry, Kat, your sound cut out for a second there. So. Okay, I don't know what's the last part you heard me say. Uh, a cousin with jury duty? Yeah, so she had jury duty um, in Atlanta and um, a week after she um, completed the jury duty, um, a person in her jury pool actually tested positive for COVID. And so they, they had everyone in that jury pool test. And so my cousin tested positive and she's also the caregiver for her mother, her elderly mother. And her mother was in her late, early 70s, late 60s. And unfortunately she had also um, tested positive. So she had actually got COVID from being a juror and then also went home and then her mother contracted it and they both passed away. And so when we talk about grief, loss and depression and then we overlay that with COVID because COVID itself can be depressing just by the state of just knowing so many people are dying and then the fact that we cannot mourn or grieve in the traditional way we can't come together in the family unit the way we're used to assembling every evening at each other's house and being there for the services it is creating a lot of um issues for people and so i just kind of want to talk about how we can use social networks to really engage and to be there for each other when we're dealing with depression, um, grief and loss. Next slide. So your social networks are basically your groups, groups of people in which you interact with socially. They can be family, friends, neighbors, coworkers. If you are a person that goes to church or to temple or to the synagogue, those that you worship with, they also can be individuals who you may have a bowling team that you've been bowling for years with or a group that you do scrapbooking with or just a group that you travel with but whatever it is that's your group that's your circle and that allows you the ability to interact with human beings and I, I laugh all the time I remember my granddaddy he used to hate calling any type of service number because he always he said I want to speak to a human being and not these automated services and so social networks allows us to really interact with human beings. And that is what really comprises of our social networks. Um, next slide, please, Sean. So ways that we can connect. So when we think about COVID right now, we cannot connect the way we're used to assembling physically in the same space, but we can definitely connect through phone, which is one of the, the, the most trusted ways because people like to hear people's voices, right? Computers. Um, Sometimes we do drive by. So <clears throat> this summer we had a lot, I have a big family. So we had a lot of open houses. So we actually did drive by open houses where you, dro you drove by, um, you, you gave the gift and if, if they had a plate, they gave you the plate through the window and you kept it moving. We did the same thing for a couple of my aunt's birthdays who um, I believe one aunt turned 75 and another one like 73 and we rolled past the house and dropped off gifts and we know no one got out the car, but we had to become creative, but there are ways that you can do that. And then the good old traditional mail, whether you use um, snail mail through USPS or email, these are ways in which we can still stay connected to people, although we are not there physically. Um, next slide, please. And some of the things that are some of the reasons why you connect, first of all, just to check in, you know, when COVID was happening, I actually had Dr. Johnson who spoke earlier on one of my family calls. We started having family calls um, weekly. And at one point I actually had, um, a, I'm a public health professional, but I had a, a mental health professional and I have a cousin in Nashville who's a medical professional, and a medical doctor. And we actually held a series for just the family. We invited all my family now, it's, just huge, it's a huge family. We invited them all on this Zoom and they were able to hear the do's and the don'ts related to COVID. And you know, that changed over time, but they were able to hear it from trusted sources and for people who actually understood and knew the science behind it. And so just checking in with family to make sure that they're okay. You connect to comfort them, um, especially if they've dealt with the loss. 
um, just to show you care. Sometimes it doesn't have to be any other reason other than I miss you and I just want you to know that I care or I'm concerned about you. And then sometimes just to share information. You know, I got some aunts every time something else comes on um, um, CNN or MSNBC around COVID, they're on the line making sure that everybody knows what's going on. And so sometimes just to share information. And then there are others that come together and connect during COVID just to offer prayer or affirmations or times of meditation because our spirit needs to be rejuvenated, especially in a time such as this. Next slide. And so we have to become innovative and become creative. So um, we, you know, I have colleagues um, through Robert Woods Johnson alumni and we have weekly happy hours, right? Um, they just have a weekly happy hour where everybody gets on the Zoom and everyone is talking and sharing you know, things that are happening with them. Nobody's really trying to talk about anything negative or depressing, but just a happy moment, just to celebrate good things. And then some of us that are in church or in other religious circles, we have weekly prayer and meditation um, sessions virtually um, through Zoom and through conference calls. Um, there's this new thing called virtual babysitting. So I have a friend now, her mom is all the way down in Texas, but she needs about an hour, hour and a half away from the kids because she's with them all day, even doing homeschooling. So her mom, their grandmother gets on the Zoom and they do games and activities on the Zoom to give her daughter time to just have some me time, maybe to take a nap or something. So we call that virtual babysitting, right? But that also helps the grandmother because she has not been able to come up here and spend time with the grandchildren. So she's getting this quality time weekly with her grandchildren, even, if, even though it's over the computer, but that interaction is priceless. Um, virtual movie nights. There are some families that pick a movie on YouTube and they all get on YouTube and someone shares the screen and they watch the movie together. And the wonderful thing about doing it on Zoom, the movie can be playing and yet you can still interact and talk with your family members like you would if you were at the movie theater for those who do talk in the theater. Um, and then you have virtual dinner night or date night. And then we've a lot of young people have been throwing virtual watch parties, right? So when you know they have a DJ that's actually playing the music and people are actually up and dancing in their living room and they're connecting with other folk that are doing the same thing in their living room. But what they're doing is they're connecting socially because they understand that in order to not succumb to the depression that could be caused by COVID and life in general, um, and especially if you're dealing with grief and loss, um, due to COVID and other circumstances. These are some of the innovative, creative things that um, individuals are doing so that they don't have to feel alone and isolated. isolated. Next slide, please, Sean. So just remember this, you can be physically distant and remain socially connected, right? We just gave you some examples of how to do some of these things. Some of these can be done over the phone. Some can be done virtually through Zoom and over the internet. But just remember, just because you're not physically with people does not mean that you have to be socially and emotionally detached from those individuals that you love. Next slide. So I wanna now open it up for questions for the presenters. So I'm going to, there were a couple of questions, well, there was one question in the Q and A box, but it was more of a programming question. And I think it's already been answered. So do we have any questions coming in um, for our presenters? And again, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to, to type them in through the, the Q&A box uh, located on your screen and we will pass them to, to our presenters. Thank you. Kent, I want to I want to thank you for the uh, for that idea of the virtual babysitting. I, that's the first time I've heard of that, and that is that is fantastic. Uh, Lucy is asking. Uh, oh, I'd love to see the speaker's last slides again to uh, share with family members. Um, Kent, would you would you be okay if uh, I was able to share those your slides um, with the audience? Okay, um, Lucy, if you would like to uh, just type in your email. Um, in here and I will send them to you after uh, after we're done here. I would actually invite anyone that would like to receive a copy of the slides. If you want to share your email with us, we can also send it to you as well. All right. Um, Julie is asking, how do you set up the dinner? 
Uh, I'm a little, little off on that. I'm not sure specifically what she's asking here. So uh, I've, I've had some questions about that, the virtual dinner dates. So it depends on how romantic, if it's a romantic date or if it's just a family date. So for example, those who are dating, I have seen um, one person actually call and order dinner for the other person. They could even be in a different city or different state and they would have the DoorDash folk deliver the food. And then we then I would have the food, let's say it was me that did that. I would also have prepared at my home or whether it was the same food delivered to me. And we would get on the Zoom and literally while we're eating, have a conversation as if we're sitting across the table from each other. Um, there have been other family groups where it may be, for example, macaroni and cheese or lasagna night. So you have four different family members are gonna have dinner night and everybody cooks their version of, of the ma macaroni and cheese or the lasagna. You know, if you got big family like me, everybody thinks that every, there's always an aunt that thinks hers is better than the other. So then everyone cooks their dish and everybody is on the Zoom eating it together. So you basically get the meal however, it, however you need to do it, whether you prepare it yourself or it's delivered to you or you order it. But the point is at 6 p.m. we're all sitting down to eat together to have the conversation on video, et cetera. So that's kind of how that happens. All right, here's another one uh, about the happy hour. Uh, are only good comments or discussions allowed? The point of happy hour is to be happy. So only things that will make you happy are allowed to be discussed at that time. <laughs> uh, all right, we're still, uh, still waiting to see if any more questions will roll in. Uh, Say we'll give it another another minute or two. If not, then uh, I think we'll transition to to Vanessa to uh, to wrap up our presentation for today. Uh, all right, I think that's about all we we have right now. Uh, oh, we got one more. Um, any ideas for older adults without access to smartphones? Um, so I do have a suggestion, you know, th there are still um, conference call lines that are free. So if you don't have a smartphone and say you want to connect with your family members, there's a website called freeconferencecall.com. So maybe you can have a niece or one of your children or a grandchild to actually go on freeconferencecall.com and actually get a conference call number. And like my family uses them all the time, the conference call numbers too. And you can use them. I mean, once you get the number and it's registered to you, it's free and you get your passcode, you can use it as often as you want. You can use it to plan family reunions or whatever, but bottom line is you don't have to have a smartphone for that. You can use a house phone to call freeconferencecall.com, dot, um, dot their, their particular conference call lines. So there are ways that you can do it without actually having to have smartphone or computer technology. All right, I believe this uh, this next question would be best suited for, for Jennifer. Um, uh, there was a national uh, 800 suicide hotline number. Are there any uh, numbers that are, are more local or, or statewide? Um, yeah. Could, could you speak a little more to that, please? Sure. So. Um... You know, I gave one for Detroit Wayne Integrated Network, the 24-hour helpline. Um, it's 1-800-241-4949. Um, 1-800-241-4949. I would say if, if you have someone who's potentially suicidal, really to go to a local emergency department, call this, you know, this Detroit 24-hour um, helpline. The National Suicide Prevention Lifeline is good. It's the resource that they do nationally. It's goal, it won't necessarily give you long-term counseling, but it's good for getting through a crisis. They have good training. And there's also um, a text line you can text to 741-741. Um, and they have trained folks, many of whom are local, you know, they, it's sort of like 911. There's one number, but often they route the calls locally um, that you can go to. But like, I would, I would say that those, 
the suicide um, prevention lifeline and the text line are for crises and for and absolutely call them right. And if you're looking for more like regular care to reach out to your doctor, try to find a counselor. And it's not an or, you can do both. Sure. I hope that answered the question. Um, and I can put this in the chat too, uh, for, for individuals who live in, in Genesee County near Flint, uh, Genesee Health System, um, which is the community mental health organization up here, uh, has a crisis line as well. Uh, the number is 810-257-3740. Uh, and again, I can I can put that in the in the chat box for everybody. Yeah, and I would and I would say there's almost not a not a wrong way to reach out. Like if you're need help, pick one, do your best, and if it's not quite the right place, they'll get you to the right place. Uh, one one more question uh, from Sylvia. So is it normal to like doing church online? Uh, I I can't speak to that, but uh, I can't do. You have no, any, uh, I love, I've been a church boy all my life directing the, the choirs and you know my grandmother was a musician in our church and you know our family is in ministry and I we have been I love it online because I think that we have to think outside the box and we've been so socialized to doing things one way and I think that what we're finding is that we're even having an even broader reach as we are going virtual so I love it as well silly so I don't think it's not normal I think it's a great thing. All right, we have one more question here and I'll put the slide back up. Uh, the title of Dr. Lichtenberg's book um, is Grief and Healing Against the Odds, A Personal Story. Uh, and the, the link is available on the screen if you can see it. Uh, if you would like more information, feel free to email uh, Vanessa or, or myself and we can get that information to you. Uh, all right, and just one more, more of a comment to, to wrap it up before we uh, pass on to Vanessa. Um, all of the speakers were great and the information was timely. Thank you so much for all of the coping tips. Oh, very good, thank you. Uh, Vanessa, do you wanna uh, bring us in for a landing here? Yes. <laughs> all right, so thank you. Big thanks to our speakers, Dr. Peter Lichtenberg, Dr. Jennifer Johnson and Dr. Ken Key. We deeply appreciate your time sharing this valuable information with us. Um, we also thank all of you, our attendees, for joining us today. Today's presentation has been recorded and we will be uploading all of our Lunch and Learn recordings to our website at the end of our fall series. So our last Lunch and Learn for our fall series is Tuesday, December 8th, same time, 11 a.m. The topic is on skin care, and we have a dermatologist from the University of Michigan as our speaker. Um, so I really think it's gonna be a great uh, health-focused presentation. Um, it's going to use the same Zoom link and dial-in information as today. So we hope you're able to join us. And if not, that would be recorded. You can watch it on our website. If there's anyone with us today that's not a member of the HBE program, and you would like to join, we can easily sign you up over the telephone. Uh, all you have to do is just give us a call at 313-664-2616. When you become a member with our HB program, you'll receive our biannual newsletter. You'll learn about research studies and you'll learn about future programmings like this one today. So thanks again to everyone. Please stay safe and have a very happy Thanksgiving. Thank you again to our to our speakers today. Uh, that was wonderful. Have a great day, everybody. All right, thank you.